Hey, what's up? This is Udulena from Udulena Digital. Welcome to my channel and be sure to subscribe if you're new here. For those of you who already subscribed, I'm very sorry. I've been away for a few weeks, uh, but I had amazing holiday, which really helped me recharge mentally, emotionally after the winter here in UK. So I'm back full with energy and committed to post a video every week on some of my favorite topics, like uh, mainly book reviews. And today I'm reviewing another book which you requested. Thank you so much for the suggestion. I've read this book long time ago and now I kind of remembered, oh, this is a good idea for a video. So here it is by popular demand, The New Silk Road by Peter uh, Frankopan. So for those of you who have watched my video of Tim Marshall's book, uh, Prisoners of Geography, you can check it here. Uh, this is kind of a similar uh, book. I think it will be, let's say, first you read Prisoners of Geography so that you kind of straighten up your geography level and get, get it up to date. And then you can go to the New Silk Road. Uh, however, I would warn you that this book is much less readable. Uh, it is very interesting. It is very packed with facts. It's quite dense. Uh, however, it is a bit difficult. Let's say when you start reading, you kind of like overload with information from the first few, few pages. So here I made some notes so that you can kind of get an idea about the book, but I do recommend you to read through it. And it will be actually very interesting to see if there's any interviews and uh, late discussions with the writer on what he thinks uh, has happened with the Silk Road now in the development uh, after <laughs> post-COVID and post-2020. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with the term of Silk Road, the Silk Road is uh, basically a geographer's invention in late 19th century, a German geographer uh, Friedrich von uh, Rennhofen uh, invented it and basically it describes the road of caravans which carried silk, mainly silk and spices from China, uh, from Asia to uh, through entirely uh, the whole Central Asian Middle East up to Europe. Uh, so this is the road if you've written, if you've read uh, Marco Polo's notes, this is the same road. And it is uh, comprising huge territory of countries that starting with China, India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, whole Central Asia, so Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, uh, Turkey, then you have Syria, Iran, uh, all the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia, and then you reach the Balkans with Turkey. Uh, so I'm right at the end of the, <laughs> I'm coming from Bulgaria, so I'm from the Balkans. So I'm right at the end of the Silk Road, right between the East and the West. Uh, so for me, I'm not really taking any sides here. Uh, but the main idea is that in the past, there was a lot of um, connection between these countries. There was a lot of uh, intervention and traveling, not only of uh, goods like silk and spices, but so much more ideas, religions languages, words, agricultural um, species, uh, like for example, peaches, like there would not have been peaches in Europe or cherries of, of, if there was no <laughs> Silk Road. So all these things were traveling as at that time, uh, Europe in the Middle Ages, let's say, was not very well developed, was kind of broken by fights and uh, bloody wars after the fall of the Roman Empire. Whereas on the East, this was strong and uh, quite developed, let's say quite on the edge when it comes to inventions. Uh, so what the writer is talking about is kind of some trends of the recent years, which we see, especially with the involvement, strong involvement of China into developing and uh, reconstructing the Silk Road again uh, through infrastructure improvements and projects. So it's not about a cultural project, let's be friends with the countries on the Silk Road. It's actually a very hard <laughs> investment commitment project uh, started from uh, President Xi of China. Uh, it's called the Belt and Road Initiative and it's not comprising only the Silk Road countries but also countries in Africa, uh, even the Caribbean. So huge amount of the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, 
According to the World Bank in 2017, there is not a single country in the top 10 fastest growing economies, which is in the Western Hemisphere. Everything is happening on the East and we kind of have been hearing a lot about it, that there is a shift of power going on. But I think now, in the following years, we are starting to feel very, very strongly this shift of power um, actually materializing in front of our eyes. If Even if someone was not believing until now or was thinking that uh, the West is still very strong, uh, you will start to see that um, this is not the case and the West is kind of following uh, what's happening on the East and uh, major companies and corporations are actually serving now the Eastern market, Chinese market, Indian market, and trying to adjust to their tastes and needs uh, because these are, let's say, the largest uh, largest markets for them. For example, uh, companies like Starbucks, like all the luxury brands like uh, Burberry, Prada, etc. Uh, their main markets are now in China. Uh, so you have heard probably anecdotally such things, but what's interesting about this initiative is that it is funded by China and. It comprises of an investment, at least a com commitment of investment in 2013 of 10 trillion dollars. And mainly these are distributed as loans, which China is providing to countries uh, on, let's say, the so-called Silk Road. As, as I mentioned, this Silk Road is now much more expanded than Asia. <laughs> it gave us a few examples that of the of the infrastructure projects that China is, fund, is funding. A lot of times companies, um, companies and countries are not being able to repay these loans as they are ver various uh, stages of economic development. Uh, and uh, this has turned into a very easy way for China to actually get some assets uh, and uh, concessions on major, uh, major ports, major uh, islands, areas of interest for them. So politically, you can see why China is, in, is, of course, investing heavily. But also, you can see that it's not only coming from China, also Russia and also other countries in the region are actively playing a strong role into uh, this project of unification. Uh, and this is not about uh, cultural unification, it's about uh, building building roads really building relationships again if you look at the 20th century the whole region has been really split and separated uh, by areas of influence uh, there was the communist russian influence and the american democratic inf zones of influence and pretty much the whole world has been split amongst them and now historically these countries are kind of like well we've been neighbors for centuries and we've been having trade connections within centuries why don't we now after the cold war is long over why don't we now unite and uh, kind of build better infrastructure in increase trade uh, in uh, strike more deals between each between each other and get each other rich like enrich ourselves because if you think about roads and infrastructure uh, this is a major improvement for trade when you think about countries like Kazakhstan where a third of the roads are deemed unusable with an improvement of their of their infrastructure is uh, happening the way it is uh, being planned. Uh, this can mean a lot of improvements, a lot of opportunities for people in this region. On the other side, what we see happening in the West is exactly the opposite. Unfortunately, in the last five years or more, uh, since 2016, actually, things started going very in a direction which was kind of predicted, but I was hoping it's not going to happen. I was reading about uh, the Brexit discussions very early in the 2000s, and I thought that it's not going to happen, but it did, essentially. Uh, so this is having already very negative consequences, in my opinion, for the UK and also for Europe. Uh, the decisions with uh, Trump's election, uh, which uh, shook America, kind of divided a lot the, the, the opinion there between pro-Trump, anti-Trump. Uh, and in general, you can see that the policy of the United States is changing from a country that is trying to control and trying to get involved into everybody's uh, foreign politics into a country which is trying to focus more on its internal problems. Uh, and the same with Europe, I think like uh, the countries are more focused on their internal development, pro progress now, recovery after COVID, rather than uh, on trade, on expanding international relations and uh, on uh, uniting. 
And you can look at historically that whenever you have unification between nations, whenever you have uh, improved uh, trade conditions, when you have lower fees for trade, things start to pick up, especially when you have a lot of lot of different countries, uh, which is the case in Europe. Um, and uh, what we see on the east side uh, between countries like Russia, like China, uh, of course, with a major, major role of China and their investments in the so-called New Silk Road, uh, we see that um, there are uh, very concrete efforts being done to improve infrastructure, to improve trading and uh, communication between these countries. And this is why it's also a road. The road is so important because the infrastructure creates opportunities for trade, uh, improves conditions, and essentially leads to the enrichment, gradual enrichment of these countries. We can see that there is a strong middle class developing now in India and China, which is influencing a lot uh, the shift of economy, the demand of products, and uh, of course um, society and uh, how, how these countries are interacting between each other. So this is the book which I was talking about today. As I said, it is quite dense with facts. Uh, you have to have some patience to read it. I could not read every single fact of it. It's, I was underlining a lot of things, but he has done an amazing job into providing a lot of, lot of, lot of data. Uh, but uh, let's say if you want to grab the full concept of the book, uh, you have to read it slowly into, uh, into chapters, think through, maybe make some notes and uh, until you assimilate the full content. There's a lot of information that's going in. Uh, overall, uh, quite an eye-opening um, eye opening read, and I think it's going to be interesting if he writes another book now post-pandemic and how uh, the pandemic has um, developed in, in and affected the new Silk Road. Has it improved it even more or has this uh, close down between nations actually stopped all these efforts that have been done uh, this is very interesting to see and will be interesting to see if there is any interviews or uh, opinions from this writer on this topic. This is all from me for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you like this content. Please subscribe to my channel and I'll be back with a new video next week.